Well, thank you, Steve. It's a great privilege to be here. I'm absolutely humbled by the talent I've seen on this stage today. It's awesome. I was, and I come from a position of privilege, and I recognize that. I was privileged to study medicine at the University of Cape Town. But what I learned was that the real truths that were important to me, I learned not in the lesson rooms. I learned them in the fields and the mountainside around the university. And I learned this truth, that what happens in your life is what you believe will happen. And what we really need in life is a coach who will give us the self-belief to do what's extraordinary. And that's the focus of my talk today. In 1954, I was age five, and at that time the goal was for a person to run the mile in under four minutes. There were two major competitors, Bannister on the left and John Landy on the right. And as you can see, Bannister was the first, and John Landy was the second runner to break the four-minute mile. But the question is, why was Bannister the first when Landy was perhaps the better athlete? And if we look at the progress of the mile, what you notice is that between 1931 and 1954, the world record improved by about five seconds. Most of the change occurred during the Second World War when two Swedish athletes who were not fighting in the war because Sweden was neutral, so they had lots of time to train, they took the world record down to four minutes and one second. And then they trained so well, they did so well, they were declared professional, and so the record stuck for nine years. And during that time, John Landy, in a period of two years, ran the mile in four minutes and two seconds on seven occasions. And this is what he concluded. Frankly, I think the four-minute mile is beyond my capabilities. Two seconds may not sound much, but to me it's like trying to break through a brick wall. Someone may achieve the four-minute mile the world is wanting to desperately, but I don't think I can. And once you say, I don't think I can, that will be the outcome. So Roger Bannister on May the 6th, 1954, broke the world record, and 46 days later, John Landy ran three seconds faster than he'd ever run in his life before. And what was the difference? The difference was that Bannister had a coach who believed in him, and Landy was self-coached. And he had required someone else to break the world record before he believed it was possible. He lacked the coach who believed in himself. Bannister, on the other hand, on May the, 5th, May the 6th, 1954, it was a typical summer's day in Britain. It was rainy, overcast, wet, and miserable. <laughs> and Bannister arrived at the track, and he told his coach, I'm not going to do the race. I'm not interested. The conditions are too bad. And 50 years later, he remembers what his coach said to him at the time. Uh, the crucial thing that he said was, well, I think you can run a 356 mile. If he believed that, I hope he did. It certainly was a helpful comment. And he said, if you have the chance and you don't take it, you may regret it for the rest of your life. So 50 years later, Bannister still doesn't know if the coach really believed he could run a 356, but it doesn't matter because he achieved it on that day. The next great athlete that I came across was an, an Australian athlete called Herb Elliott. And I'm going to show you a video clip of him running the last lap of the 1960 Olympic Games 1500 meters. With three quarters of a lap left, Elliott leads by eight meters. Jazzy passes Rosa Bolli and goes into second place. Into the final turn, Elliott starts his kick. With each stride, he goes further and further ahead of Jazzy. With 100 meters left, Herb Elliott is all alone. He is now racing against the clock with a new world record as his goal. Herb Elliott's time, three minutes, 35 and 6 tenths seconds. He breaks his own world record by 4 tenths of a second. His coach said to him, faster, it is only pain.
You noticed how hum humble he was at the finish, where he waited to, to congratulate the others. This is what he said. To run a world record, you have to have the absolute arrogance to think that you can run a mile faster than anyone who has ever lived. And then you have to have the absolute humility to actually do it. And that's the art of sport. You have to both have the arrogance and the humility. In the 1960s, was the greatest athlete of all time. I'm the greatest. I said that even before I knew I was. <laughs> I was fortunate to be influenced by Professor Christian Barnard, who on December the 3rd, 1967 prefer, performed the first human heart transplant. He had the self-belief and the courage to do what no one else had done, to remove the heart from a patient and to replace it with someone else's heart. I was in America at the time, and I was influenced by the understand American football, and it became, I realized that this is one of the most complex sports in the world. The athletes are the best, the coaches are the best. The key player in American football is the quarterback. And this is one of the great players of all time, Joe Montana. And this is what he said, winners imagine their dreams first. They want it with all their heart and expect it to come true. There's no other way to live. Montana was fortunate to have the greatest coach perhaps of all time to coach him. And that coach, Bill Walsh, said the following. When Joe Montana came to the 49ers, he believed he was extraordinary. My job was to convince him that he was beyond extraordinary. And the next clip, you have to understand perhaps a bit about American football, but the point is this was a key moment in Joe Montana's career where he pulls a play out of from nowhere and his team, which has 58 seconds to move the ball six meters and one chance to do it, he achieves it. I don't want you to worry about the details of the game. I want you to get the impression of the belief systems that exists in great athletes. There wasn't a doubt in our mind that we were going to score on Dallas. They knew that they couldn't stop us. You only had to look across the line of scrimmage to know that. We had Joe. Who is this guy, Montana? I'm John Wayne. I'm John Wayne. And John Wayne never loses. I'm making this throw. So fasten your seatbelts now. We've got turbulence and plenty of it here in Candlestick Park. How is this one going to end? On the lines up at the five. And on third down and three, he rolls right, looking to throw. Looking to throw, and he throws into the end zone. I've had the privilege to work with three teams who believed they couldn't lose. This was the first team, the UCT Ike Tigers. And four of these players made the, made the Western Lions Vodacom team, which won the Vodacom Cup this year. They went 10 and 0, and they were lo losing the final until the last two minutes of the game. They scored in the 82nd minute. Not once did they believe they would not have a 10 and 0 season and that they would win that tournament. And that's the key. You have to teach the teams to believe in themselves. In the 1970s, 60s, when I returned back from, from America to South Africa, the South African cricket team was amongst the best in the world. My favorite player was Barry Richards, shown here batting. He was considered this, one of the two greatest opening batsmen of all time. Recently, he read my book and he said, your book's very challenging for future coaches. It's thought provoking. I wrote him the following SMS. I said, Barry, you will never know or imagine how you inspired me in the 60s. You were the best in the world and I wanted to try to match you in my field. Thank you for that. In the 1970s, Jim Fix came along and wrote this book, which was considered the complete book of running. It sold one million copies. And I had the, the audacity to write to him and tell him I didn't think it was the complete book of running. <laughs> Despite the fact that I'd never written an article or a book or anything. And he very gently wrote back to me, and there's the letter. And he said, thank you for the advice. And he had, in fact, changed the, the contents of the book accordingly. Was it that that inspired me to want to write the book that became Law of Running and which has now been in, in the press for 27 years? I suspect his kindness was what inspired me to do that. Running took off in the 1970s and one company that benefited was the Nike company, which was started by Phil Knight. And Knight foresaw a future in which Nike would be the dominant running shoe company that in the U.S. even before he'd sold a single running shoe. 
He wanted to, to be the dominant. That was the vision of the man. His first employer is the athlete shown on the left, which is Jeff Hollister. On the right is Steve Prefontaine, the first athlete who was ever funded by Nike. Hollister has had his own battles with cancer recently, and he's written his own biography in which he summarized what he had learned in life. And I think that's a compelling story. He writes the following. I've thought often of what it all means. Life thrusts you into a competitive environment. How do you prepare for the realities and the unknown? Hopefully you have a mentor, a coach, a barman who pushes you at the critical time. A time when someone has a belief in your future more than you do. It's not about how long you live, but how you contribute. It's about doing your best and doing the right thing. It's about recovering from your mistakes and not giving up. It's about the baton pass to a new generation. It's about the realization that you cannot go it alone. It takes a team. And he concludes, in the end, you are somewhere in the middle, part of a never-ending process. The future will never remember what was in your bank account or what kind of car you drove. The future will remember that wild ride of life where you believed in others and left a gift behind for someone else to dream the impossible. The gift was your own life. It does not matter whether it was long or short. What did you leave behind? So the truth, ladies and gentlemen, is that we're merely links in a chain. Our job is to develop a vision of the perfect world, to spread belief in our children so that they will do the extraordinary of which we were incapable. Your legacy is the, is the belief you generate in the students you teach. It is your ultimate responsibility. Thank you for your attention.